how committed am I to what I say I want? And because at the end of the day, the, if you don't believe it, no one else will. What's your writing process? I work five days a week minimally, sometimes six, sometimes seven, but I'd prefer not to. Uh, I'm always thinking about a story or uh, there's always something going on you know, in my head. I don't have regular writing hours. At various times I have. But now because I'm writing and producing and directing and doing books as well, um, my day is split up into smaller chunks and I'm often doing many different tasks in a given day uh, because I have full-time editor, full-time, um, you know, uh, line producer, VFX team, all of that. Um, uh, so when I sit down to write, I try to write for several hours minimally. I, but I, I, but it's like, you know, I, I, but I can also write on the fly if I need to. I can write almost anywhere. I can write in a moving car. I've written in Jeeps traveling through the jungle in Thailand when I did a pilot for NBC that was shot there. I mean, it's like I, I'm often working on several scripts simultaneously. Um, I'm always reading several books uh, at the same time. And then I'll come up with ideas and I'll jot them down. I'll save those. And sometimes I'll, I'll, um, I'll write them or I won't. I mean, one of the ideas I came up with recently that I liked was, um, well, two I, two I came up with that I liked. One was um, I heard about the slave revolt in Haiti where they actually succeeded you know, in, in freeing themselves. And I thought, what would have happened if before the Civil War that had happened in America, that that had spread to America and then now it's the modern day and there's a separate country of free of, of the descendants of freed black slaves. So the South, it's, la it's not the Confederacy won the, won the Civil War and we've got two Americas, it's that there's a black nation where those slaves freed themselves and what would that look like and what would our country look like? And that was an interesting idea. And another idea I came up with, which was rather amusing, was just a short story where someone would have a chance to go back in time one time and there's an artist who never got his due, was never recognized for his talent, and died without knowing that anyone would, would, you know, cared about his art. He'd been rejected a lot during his lifetime. So he goes back and convinces the official um, art authorities to like take him in and accept him and do, a sh do shows of his paintings and so forth. And the way it would be structured is we would believe throughout the story that it's Vincent van Gogh, but in the end it's Adolf Hitler. Because if Hitler had succeeded as an artist, right. he never would have gone into politics. He wouldn't have been, there'd be no Nazi party, none of that. Right. And so it just, it just struck me as a funny story that, that Hitler, had he just been appreciated for his artwork, <laughs> it would have really changed that century. Sure. So um, it was just, a, but, but again, so I, I come up with many, many ideas. Like for instance, when I mentioned sitting down to come up with 200 ideas, it's actually up to 300 now. Ideas for movies or TV shows where I just jot them down and, and, um, and sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll pursue them. It, it varies. There are certain ideas that I definitely will write. Like with Space Command, I knew I was going to do that. And I knew that I would write the entire season, which, which I have. Um, and then we'd shoot it. So, um, but I'm always working on something. I'm never lying fallow. Um, and some scripts, it's like, like over the next few months, we'll be rewriting this, the final six hours of season one of Space Command. But meantime, I plan to write, you know, I mean, we're also going to write and shoot all, all the other five pilots of the Showrunners Network. Um, you know, and so that's, so we've written Sweet Haven now. And, and again, it's always just, who are the characters? What is the idea? How does this move? How does this grow? What is it saying? You know, but it's always through characters. I mean, it's, you know, with, with, with Sweet Haven, part of the genesis of that was my friend Michael Harney, He's in Project Blue Book. He's in Orange is the New Black. He's in um, For All Mankind. And yet he never gets to play these wonderful lead roles that he should. And so I said, well, how would you like to play a cop and be the lead in Sweet Haven where all the people under 60 die? And, but I also created his brother, who will also be playing, who went the exact opposite path and is very dangerous. And I thought that would be fun too because I have my physical trainer, who I've been with for 30 years, Elaine and I both, um, he had an identical twin brother who was very, very different from him. And so that became of interest to me. So it isn't just using a cliche from soap operas, you know, of the twins, the good twin and the bad twin. It's just the interesting thing of someone who goes very different from someone who looks like him. You know, it's just fun. And, and then, you know, so it's, but, um, but any given week I'm writing, I'm, 
uh, you know, working in my producer cap capacity. So I'll be meeting with my VFX team and reviewing VFX shots. I'll be marketing. I'll be doing the Mr. Sci-Fi stuff. I'll be building my audience. It's all part of the job. You know, it's all, you know, I am, you know, in directing. I mean, today we were just, you know, getting the sets ready to get them, get them up and running, you know, so it's exciting. It's fun. When you were riding in the Jeep uh, mm -hmm. through the jungles sure. of... Uh, typing. Uh, oh, you were typing? Yeah, I can type in a moving vehicle. And, and so th this wasn't on like a legal pad? You no. were actually... Oh, okay, wow. Yeah, wow. yeah I, I can ride on, on a legal pad, but but it's easier to type in a moving vehicle um, because you're, when you're jostled and you're trying to write, it, you kind of, you know, do that. But um, but I'm, I'm very fortunate. I think it's because when I was a kid, I read books. My mom would have me in the back seat and I would read voraciously. And I think the fact that I did that all, you know, kind of meant that I'm not, I don't get car sick. And so, um, so yeah, and, and often I've had to write um, under deadline in those kind of circumstances. I can write with music playing. I mean, I can be in like a busy coffee shop or something and I'm not distracted. So, um, you know, I just go into that world, you know, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's very fun. How did you figure out your writing process? <sighs> well, um, in television, you have deadlines, and so you just have to get very, you write very fast. You'll have maybe a week or two to write an entire script. The hardest I ever, I ever had, the hardest experience was I had to write two hour scripts in one week for two different series. There was one period of three months where I was writing, I think, nine scripts for six different shows, and and I could juggle between outlining, I'd be outlining one while writing the script for another, but there were two shows they would not budge on the deadline, and so the way I did that was I would write 10 pages of one in the morning, have lunch to clear my head, then write 10 pages of the other one in the afternoon, and I did that for six days straight. So at the end of six days, I had two 60-page scripts. And one was Forever Night, and the other was Space Precinct, and they both got shot. They both got made. And, um, uh, and then another time, I wrote 55 pages in one day, which was for, uh, I think, an animated show called Black Star. And Elaine was a faster typist. That was back when we were on typewriters. And so I was writing the pages freehand and handing them to Elaine she was typing. And at the end of the day, I had the entire script written. So, and that got made too, of course. And uh, so there, there's something, there's a very different energy where you know that everything you write will get made. It's, it's, then it becomes very pragmatic. It's not like, you, you know, you don't, you don't wait for inspiration. You put in the work. You just, you know, it's like, if I have to write a, an entire script over a weekend, I, I can, I will. I prefer not to, <laughs> you know, but, um, but I find that qualitatively, there are scripts that I've written in a week that were every bit as good as scripts that took me a year. And, uh, you know, so I'm, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I, I have faith in my abilities after all this time. I know what I can do. Um, though you have to know the story you're telling because you can't afford to get lost in your script. It can't, it can't go south. You have to know. That's why outlining, particularly in TV, is so important, because you have to know what the, what the structure is, what the, how it tracks. That doesn't mean you can't um, de depart from that if you know you're going somewhere better, but you just can't. There's not a lot of room for uh, that wild experimentation, you know, so. But, um, but, but usually, I find that I'm, my, I'm clearest in terms of my writing in the afternoons. So I'll usually write in the afternoons, but I can write any time that I need to write, you know, if, if I'm under the gun. And uh, I remember one time when we were shooting the first hour of Space Command, Bob Picardo mentioned that I'd referenced The Wizard of Oz in an early scene that he had with Doug Jones, but I didn't pay it off. And so we were sh gonna be shooting that like a few days later, and I woke up in the morning with the entire scene in my head. Uh, the paid off the Wizard of Oz. And so while, so I said to Elaine, you drive. And so while we were driving to the studio, I typed the scene. And then when we got to the studio, I went into the office and said, print this out. Then I gave it to, to Doug and to Bob. And that, that day we shot it. <laughs> so, but that was because Bob was right. He had a great um, note. And, uh, but it was just like, but that's how, so sometimes the process is like that. Um, other times, you know, it's uh, other times you'll have to go through draft after draft after draft, and uh, and hopefully find find your way. You know, but but TV has a much shorter um, uh, you know uh, runway, <laughs> so you better be able to take flight when you run out of you know the, the the landing strip. You know, it's you you better be able to to hit the air, 
And uh, but that's why. But I love the speed of television, and I love the fact that most the, what, what what you write gets made. You know, it's uh, I never could have had a happy life as a screenwriter. I don't think that would have been for me at all. Well, that was my next question is, what would your advice be to someone who doesn't have the advantage of a deadline? They are their own deadline. Yes. And, and they are their own audience for a while. Work with a timer. That's what I do. Um, we all have timers in our, in our phones. So say, okay, I'm going to write. You have to write on a regular basis. You have to have a discipline. And it's not, so if you say, um, my writing hours are going to be from 9 a.m. to 12, you know, noon. And and you find a space where you're not going to get distracted. You find a writing space. It could be at a Starbucks. It could be a corner of your home. It doesn't matter where it is, but it's, that's your writing place. And people know it's your writing place. And they know that your time, that's your writing time. And it's sacrosanct. You don't do other stuff in, that, in the, those hours. And you set your alarm for three hours or two hours or one hour, whatever it is. And you sit there. And even if nothing comes, you sit there. You do the work. And... Um, and you treat it just like a job, just like if you're working at a shoe store, you know, you're working for yourself. But you cannot just watch TV. You cannot go, you know, um, you know, talk with your pals. No, you're a writer. And uh, but also setting a deadline for when a draft will be done is very important. So you just say, okay, uh, three weeks from now, I'm going to have a draft written. It doesn't have to be good. It just has to be the beginning, middle, and end. And then you can go back and revise. But just you, just, you go. You know, and if and um, but professional writers need to treat it like a job. The best schedule of anyone I ever knew was Ray Bradbury. He would write five days a week. He would get up in the morning, write um, until lunchtime. Then he would uh, have lunch. Then he would take a nap, and in the afternoon he would attend to business. And then evenings and weekends were for the family. And he did that for over, over seventy years. So pretty phenomenal. Well, these wonderful things that we have in our pockets to shoot film yes. also are a distraction. Yes. And now we can check news and now everything well, that we're interested in yes. is now going to be reflected back over and over again. Yeah, and us. you have to be careful. I mean, again, you can lose yourself in all of these pursuits. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's like how committed I am to say, how committed am I to what I say I want? And because at the end of the day, the, if you don't believe it, no one else will. And the only way they can believe it is if you get things finished, if you get things out there, if you, you know, I mean, nobody ever says, I want to be a brain surgeon, but I want it to be really easy. You know, it's they know that you're, you, know, you put in work, you know, it's like, and, but, but people think that writing is going to be easy. It's not. Some days it's easy, some days it's hard. But fortunately, if you're doing it right, the audience can't tell what was hard and what was easy, which is fun, which is really fun. Um, when it's easy, when it's good, and, and it comes easily, it, it is good. You know, I'm not deluding myself. When it's hard, though, I can struggle and struggle, and if I nail it, ultimately, uh, the audience has no idea that it was difficult. It flows, you know, so that's a relief. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, it's, but, you know, it's, the script is just the blueprint. The script is just the arrow pointing the way. You know, I, I don't... I mean, for instance, I have to decide, like today we were having an actress try on one of the costumes to see if it worked. We were deciding if she would be on a bed in this hospital room or if she would be in like this, this um, you know, uh, cylinder thing uh, that would be like with tubes plugged in and things and computer panels and stuff. And so it's like that's part of the writing process too. Uh, determining what the lighting is going to be. Is it going to be subdued? Is it going to be bright? What color is it going to be? What lens are we going to be using? These are all creative decisions. Um, you know, I've been acquiring, uh, like I, I own, I think, 14 or 15 spacesuits now. You know, so I, I acquire them from different productions or my mom got me one when I was a kid. And, um, and then you redress them. I get sets from, the best place to get sets from is uh, big budget science fiction movies that tanked. Because no one saw them and the production design is great. And then you, re you redress them so they're yours, but it gives you this level of um, just artistry and, and detail and they, because they put so much money into it. So, you, um, so that's, and that's a trick I learned from Rod Serling because when he shot Twilight Zone uh, at MGM, he used every prop and costume and set that they had, you know. Uh, and when I was a producer at Sliders, on Sliders at Universal, I said, can I use everything from every Universal production 
ever made? And they said, huh, no one's ever asked that. Let me find out. And they came back and they said, with a very few exceptions, yes. And we were using stuff from Jurassic Park and Time Cop and 12 Monkeys and on and on. It was fabulous. Uh, uh, the best little whorehouse in Texas. We shot one of our episodes in that house. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, it's, um, I'm in the business of being ingenious. <laughs> And so the more I come up, the more I pull a rabbit from a hat, the more that I come up with a clever idea, the more I say, okay, this is, this is the way to get where we're going. Um, it's a series of problems that need to be solved, but it's a joyous process. And I mean, to take something that's just in your head and put it out in the world so everyone can see it, it's just, uh, it's just there's, no, there's nothing like it. It's wonderful. When, when it comes together, it's great. You know, I... Uh, I love that process. And I feel part of a tradition. I feel in a way that Rod Serling and Harlan Ellison and all these wonderful people who uh, inspired and, and, and guided me, I'm part of that tra tradition. And the reason I like to mentor people is because I feel that I can then pass on what I've learned from, from these amazing people. And uh, it doesn't end with me. I'm just part of the, part of the process, part of the flow. Have you ever mentored someone or met someone that you could just tell they weren't going to be teachable? Yes, I have. And, uh, and the lovely thing is I don't ever assume that I have to succeed with anybody. Like one of the rules of my round table when I started was there's no, any, everyone is welcome if they come with a good heart. There's no decision as to who's deserving. No, des no decision as to who has talent or who's going to make it or not. If someone comes with a good heart, writers, producers, actors, directors, editors, composers, anybody, they're welcome because we're creating a community, a supportive community. Um, when I mentor people, if they're just not going to get it, I just stop talking because it's sort of like, you know, this, when they'll say, well, this is what I'm going to do. And I'll say, well, that's probably not going to work. <laughs> you know, I don't, and I'm not usually not that blunt, but I'll say, well, you know, here's a few other ideas that would, I think be easier uh, to make happen. And if they just are resistant to that, I say, okay, well, go with God. And also, if they come back and say, I did that and it worked, I'll say, great. You know, because again, I don't need to have, there's no, there's no one way to do it. There's a lot of ways to fail, of course, you know. Giving up is a, is a really bad idea because when you give up, it guarantees that nothing's going to happen. But, if, but you can't just keep failing and failing and failing. You have to figure out what's going wrong. Some people can't write. And if you can't write, but you want to make film or make TV, then it'll affiliate with someone who's got the talents you don't have and do what you can do, do what you're good at. Uh, some people, for instance, Guillermo del Toro told me he's not great with dialogue. So he, you know, he's good with plot, good with imagery, my God. But it, so he affiliates with people who write dialogue well. Um, you know, you find the person, like when I mentioned earlier that I direct with Elaine, could I learn the skills that Elaine has to work with direct with actors? Yes, I could. I could learn those skills, and I'm not terrible. I mean, I can. I can work with actors. I do know what the what the through line emotionally is, and so forth. But but Elaine, having been an actor and gone to drama school and directed off Broadway, she has a depth of uh, she has a bag of tricks that I don't have. But the th but because I'm collaborating with her, I don't have to learn that stuff because she has it. So I can say, well, how, how do we get this? How do we get this effect? How do we get this actor to do this thing? And she'll then talk to them and it's like, wow, great, you know. So, um, and sometimes it's miraculous to me. Like, it's like, how did you do that? It's so good, you know, and uh, so that's, that's really fun. But on the other hand, I had to teach her to like, not think of it like directing a play. It's like, look at the monitor. See, that angle's not a good angle. <laughs> so like, turn them this way, <laughs> you know, and now, now she's much more savvy to, to camera angles and all that kind of stuff. So we, we, we learn from each other.